beloved family and friends. Welcome to this time and to this place to celebrate and to give thanks to God for the life of Christopher Jeffrey Grogan, beloved son, brother, husband to Kenny, father to Allie and Katie, son-in-law, brother-in-law, uncle, friend, and colleague, who God prepared a place for in life and in death. We gather this morning in a sanctuary, a holy place that Kenny and Allie and Katie know well. When Katie walked into this sanctuary last week, she said it felt like home. We gather in this spiritual home that Jeff knew well too, a place of great joy, love, and laughter. Kenny and Jeff were married here. Allie and Katie were baptized here. And it is here where, in a whisper to Kenny, Jeff followed amens with the army. <laughs> we gather today in the wake of Jeff's death, but just as surely we gather to celebrate Jeff's life. As we do, we enter into a, the presence of a deep and abiding mystery. For a human life is sacred. Its beginnings is sacred. Its seasons are sacred. And its ending is sacred. We also gather this morning with grieving hearts. We miss Jeff terribly, and we long for the good news of our faith that Jeff will find peace in the place that has been prepared for him in love. And we gather to share memories of Jeff, memories that assure us that the love we knew in him is forever alive within our hearts. Please join me in reciting our unison prayer of invocation. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you today our brother Jeff. We thank you for giving him to us to know and to love as a companion in our pilgrimage on earth. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us your aid so we may see in death the gate to eternal life that we may continue our course on earth in confidence until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please join in singing the hymn, Eternal Father Strong to Save, the Navy Hymn. Please stand if you are able.
Hear now the promises of God. Through Christ, God has promised us that we will live with him eternally. As it is written in the Gospel of John, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Through Christ, we can be assured that Jeff dwells in the eternal and loving embrace of God. For the eternal life that God promises us is one of love. In life and in death, we cannot be separated from the love of God that formed us, knows us by name, and has welcomed Jeff home. As Paul writes in his letter to the Romans, I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even as we grieve today, we also rejoice knowing that Jeff is received into that love of God fully in the company of his beloved parents and sister and other loved ones. And now would you please join me in reading aloud the text of Psalm 23 as printed in your bulletin. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Amen. And now please rise and join in singing Hymn number eight in the red hymnal, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
When a loved one dies, we find ourselves in a world we don't recognize. Life feels surreal and out of order. We lose our way as the ground beneath our feet feels uneven and shaky. In the midst of this rocky place, we share stories about the one who is no longer by our side. Each story helps ground us in the reality of our great loss. Story by story, we move through our grief and so begin our journey of strength and healing. To remember is simple and holy and amazingly powerful. This is what the early Christians did when Jesus was no longer with them. His disciples shared the story of his life and his death and his resurrection. In remembering him, they found strength and direction, hope and love. We do the same today. We remember Jeff and we find strength and direction, hope and love. Our remembering is a holy act. Through it, we honor Jeff's place on this earth. We give thanks to God for his life that blessed our lives and claim his place in the communion of the saints. We welcome Bill Bissell, Jeff's brother-in-law. Kenny, my sister, has uh, asked me to offer some reflections on her behalf uh, regarding Jeff, her companion, her partner, and her best friend. So as we think of Jeff today, we're struck by the sharp irony that what we most need right now are precisely the qualities he most embodied. Strength, stalwartness, a steady hand on the tiller. Jeff always manifested grace under pressure. When times got tough, he was always there, no questions asked, and taking care of whatever needed to be done quietly, behind the scenes, without a show, offering sage advice and a shoulder to cry on. Jeff was a devoted and loving father for a rich 34 years. He was dedicated to two wonderful young women, his daughters, he was a fine brother to Rick and Fitzy, a great brother-in-law, and a generous and giving friend, unstinting with his time, concern, and care for others. Jeff wore the uniform of his country with great pride, and he wore it well, as I can testify, having shipped back with him from Hawaii to San Diego on the Henry B. Wilson at the end of a deployment. He earned the respect and, boy, the quick following of the men who served under him. And he had a sharp step and a glint in his eye. He relished the stuff of strategy and competition whether playing shadow games with the Soviets in the Indian Ocean or the Pacific, stealing a mascot the day before a game, <laughs> or sabotaging the opposing team, and of course, taking on those laggards at Army. Part of his lexicon was to never fall on your sword, and of course, don't give up the ship. And Jeff never, ever came close.
close to those lapses. Sailing his father-in-law's creaky old sunfish one day at the Cape, Jeff was coming around and his wallet plopped overboard. And as he glanced at it under the waves, he was faced with an instant dilemma. Save the cash and the cards or bring the boat home? You know that boat came back safe and sound and the wallet was sacrificed to the depths despite his father-in-law's teasing that the wallet was worth a hell of a lot more than that old boat. <laughs> Jeff may have been poorer for it, but he never hesitated to do what he saw as the right, the necessary, and the good thing, despite the consequences to himself. In a storm, or facing rough seas, there was no one else you would rather have by your side or on your team. And Jeff would invariably keep everyone's spirits up while never showing how concerned he actually was in the moment. Unflappable. He had gravitas. He had grit. He had real presence and showed throughout his life genuine poise. But he was never just the straight guy, stiff, stern, serious. No. Jeff was always filled with a wicked sense of humor, a love of play, and he was highly talented, perhaps too much so for some of us, in the unleashing of very imaginative pranks. <laughs> the first time Kenny saw this handsome young man in a conservative suit at a party at the Gowdies, it took her some time to notice that the elegant design on his tie was actually a series of small horses' derrieres. <laughs> Jeff played it with a straight face. Uh, and he was always up for an expedition, very game for an exploit, and brought a genuine sense of humor and infectious joy to the proceedings. He loved football and golf, sailing and cycling. And of course, he had a repertoire of classic films that he returned to time and again, from John Wayne to Clint Eastwood and James Bond to Top Gun, The Hunt for Red October, Patriot Games, and A Few Good Men. You know, Jeff was a touchy-feely kind of guy. <laughs> he loved those chick flicks. He was, no doubt, the only member of the extended family who might, for example, receive a Borat mankini for Christmas. <laughs> Put it on and actually bring it off. <laughs> Though the giver might live to regret it, Jeff was always up for returning serve and then some. And he who laughs last, laughs best. Don't get mad. He would say with a mischievous grin, just get even. <laughs> and so he did. Jeff may not be physically present with us here today in this church, and yet he is very much here. We, each of us, cherish the lessons and the legacies he has left to us, the gifts he has given of the qualities and values by which he so well led his life. He may be just beyond our touch, and yet his presence is powerful still. As I look around 
this church. I see on the faces of those assembled here all the signs of what has brought us together today. The deep affection and love, respect and high regard we share for Jeff, for Kenny, for Allie, and for Katie. Those sentiments will long endure, and so too will Jeff continue to live in our hearts and minds and memories and stories. Now, if Jeff were here today, I think he would like me to leave you with this closing thought, something to take away from the service. Today, as many of you know, is, of course, of all days, the annual Army-Navy football game. And on that score, Jeff would undoubtedly want the last word. So on his behalf, I say, go Navy, be Army. And I have the sneaking suspicion on this day, Navy indeed will have a new angel in the stands cheering for the right side. No matter where Jeff may be, we pray that he will always find fair winds and following seas. And of course, because Jeff would want me to close with a Swahili blessing, <laughs> I say, as my Zanzibari friends do, Mungu ampe pahala pema peponi, may God grant him a beautiful place in heaven. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Allie. I'm Jeff's eldest daughter. Um, I'm here to read a poem to you all. This poem was read at the memorial service of Jim Edwins, otherwise known as Pickles, a fellow officer on the USS Henry B. Wilson DDG-7 with my father. Dad loved this poem, and I now hold it close to my heart. I am standing upon the seashore. A ship at my side spreads her white sails to the morning breeze and starts for the blue ocean. She is an object of beauty and strength. I stand and watch her until at length she hangs like a speck of white cloud just where the sea and sky come to mingle with each other. Then someone at my side says, there, she is gone. Gone where? Gone from my sight, that is all. She's just as large in mast, hull, and spar as she was when she left my side. And she's just as able to bear her load of living freight to her destined port. Her diminished size is in me, not in her. And just at that moment when someone says, there, she is gone, there are other eyes watching her coming and other voices ready to take up the glad shout. Here she comes, and that is dying. I love you, Dad. As Dad would say, 
The only easy day was yesterday. And that certainly rings true today. Um, growing up, Dad always knew exactly what to say. Uh, whether it was a valuable life lesson or a very inappropriately timed joke. So uh, my mom and Ali and I sat down together a few days ago, um, and we wrote down a list of some of our favorite dad-isms uh, that we'll carry with us, and I would love to share some of those with you today. Every morning, Dad would say, if you want to change the world, start by making your bed. On school days, up through college, he would say, focus in the classroom and socialize on the playground. On work ethic, he'd say, don't confuse effort with results. And on the success of his children, he would say, nice job, Kenny. <laughs> On the subject of boys, he'd say, you can date after you're married. <laughs> and on marriage, he'd say, marry your best friend. When answering the phone, he'd say, Joe's Bar and Grill, this is Joe speaking. <laughs> Before every takeoff, sitting in an airplane, he'd say, Lieutenant Smith is five rows back, wearing aviators and she'll let me know when you touch down. Regarding my recent speeding tickets, <laughs> he'd say, driving is a privilege, not a right. Slow down, Mario. <laughs> when reversing his own car out of the garage, he'd say, underway, shift colors, all engines, back one third. And we would remind him, gently, that he was not, in fact, still driving a destroyer. <laughs> it's just his Audi. On healthy eating, he'd say, I don't want that communist stuff. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> On unhealthy eating, he would say, the secretary will disavow any knowledge of my actions, should I be caught or captured. While training for the Pan Mass Challenge with Ali, he'd say, you know, let's just ride to the nearest bakery for muffins. <laughs> On battling and surviving two different types of cancer, he'd say, rumors of my demise have been grossly exaggerated. And on coming out of surgery, he once said to a few doctors, please notify the White House that I'm out of surgery. <laughs> <laughs> on positivity, he would say, quit it with the negative waves, Moriarty. On moving forward, he would say, left, right, left. On commitment, he'd say, all in, all the time. On perseverance, he would say, don't give up the ship. And on his favorite day of the year, Army Navy Day, he would say, beat Army. Thank you. I am Richard Grogan. I stand with uh, my son Nicholas and with Paul George. Now Paul has been instrumental in helping us all, Kenny, us all, uh, in these last days. But when he suggested I speak about Jeff for two minutes, I said, sorry, no can do. <laughs> because I, I wanted to say good morning to you because it's not a good morning. It's a horrible day outside, and it's a very sad day for all of us. Uh, but I want to welcome everybody, physically, and those watching uh, on a live stream connection. 
uh, you pay a fitting tribute to Jeff. And let me say first what is, at least to me, indelibly clear. It is simply not right that I am here and he is not. I've been told not to think that and definitely not to say it. Sorry, it's true. But now that I have said that, let me stop with all of that. Consist with with Ali and Katie, uh, consi consistent with people that have gone before me, with Bill. Let me, in a self-appointed role, lead you in the celebration of his life. I'm able to do that because the past two weeks have been, for me, a whole another lifetime. I have thoughts and memories and the clarity that allow me to stand here and fulfill this role, not in two minutes, sorry, Paul. So join with me, please. Adopt this amended tone, even now. Look up, raise your heads, your voices. Think back, even smile. Exercise strength and help me celebrate his life. Settle in a wee bit. I'm not going to go on forever. Don't worry. Uh, but this is an important task. And we owe it to three people. We owe it to, well, to four. We owe it to Jeff. We owe it to Kenny. We owe it to Allison. And we owe it to Katie. To be strong. To not let weakness accompany our grief. They deserve this. And it's an incredible family unit. Uh, they, their love and, and support has held them together in this rather impossible time. So let's start at the beginning. Jeff, of course, was not supposed to be Jeff. He was named after the doctor, a colleague of my father's, who helped deliver us all. His name is Christopher Jeffrey Grogan. Here's what happened. At the ripe old age of two or three, when Jeff arrived home, our sister Fitzy systematically destroyed, crushed every doll that she had uh, because of this new arrival. I either refused or was simply unable to say his name. I could not say Christopher. To celebrate my linguistic incapacity, he became Jeff. <laughs> and we behaved like, well, like brothers do. Uh, conflicts, conquests, consequences. Uh, but a fraternal connection that survived that all. There's nothing much good to report about that, <laughs> so I'll leave it alone entirely. And <laughs> we survived. And skip forward 18 years or so when the most extraordinary thing happened. He decided to try to attend the United States Naval Academy. A strange turn, uh, yes. It was a slight digression from our landlocked, suburban, country club, Brooks Brothers life to the dress whites and rolling seas of the US Navy. There was in the background, too, the rather unverified claim by, my, by our mother of a distant relative that had, of hers that had captained the clipper ship. Uh, better than the more likely tale of the tilling of a small field near the mouth of the Shannon. That history and our mother propelled him to the Naval Academy. And despite the sheer horror of it, the 5 a.m. reveille, the vicious 
Thebes summer. The disciplinary marching and then having five minutes or so to get formally dressed and on parade. Frankly, unbelievably, he loved it. He absolutely loved it. He loved the impossible challenge. He embraced every element of the experience. He loved the difference of it. He was more than equal to the challenge. He was his own man, gone from any shadow, any fraternal shadow at all, confident in himself, in his abilities, and right in his conviction. We all know or can imagine the immense challenge of something like the Naval Academy. Those who decide they can go no further, uh, as the self same Adam McRaven said, all they need to do is ring the bell. No recriminations, no questions, just the freedom from this horrible experience. Jeff never ever thought of doing that. It never crossed his mind. As his older brother, I was stunned. I did find it quite unbelievable, not just that my little brother was at the Naval Academy and that he was a serving officer, but he was the munitions officer on a destroyer and the weapons systems officer for a carrier group. He had the ability to, with a single touch, destroy the world. <laughs> there was no risk of that, but it was an awesome power uh, at his very fingertips. But he was immensely proud of his job, proud of the organization of which he was a part. He loved it. He absolutely loved it. That devotion and dedication to service doing something larger than himself. This pattern was equally apparent in his increasing work on behalf of the schools that we had attended. He helped build and sustain Tanaka Country Day. As chairman of the trustee board and the president of its corporation. And proud too of Noble and Greeno and what he was able to do there. In fact, I was here in late October for a, something more than my 10th reunion, but a reunion nonetheless. Jeff came to Boston, picked me up, but before we drove to Nobles, we leisurely toured Wellesley. We looked for Brigham's and Hazel's Bakery, couldn't find them, <laughs> very upset. But then we went to Dedham and walked the Nobles campus. We visited the schoolhouse, the library, the castle, the gym, yes, even the boathouse. Jeff was immensely proud of what, how no Nobles had been transformed during his role as the chairman of their trustees. He was excited about the expansion of enrollment. It was three times larger than when we had gone there. Proud too of its successful uh, uh, acceptance of women and you know, that went thoroughly and well. He was proud also, and probably most proud, of the continued advance that the school made in its educational product and its performance in the highly competitive world of secondary schools. He also ably served what we would like to think is a related education institution, the Fitzy Foundation. He was instrumental in the foundation's awarding of scholarships and stipends to young women who reflected the attributes of our sister, her intelligence, her embrace and curiosity, uh, 
uh, when she was their age at, her, at, those, at the schools to which she went. When he, he was, regrettably for himself, our interviewer in chief, with me living in London, I was a long way away. Uh, uh, Greg was not in Boston and Jeff was. So Jeff had a huge interview schedule demand. And he was, as interviewer in chief, where is it written, he would ask me, that I, a Naval Academy guy, have to interview all these Harvard people. <laughs> okay, I'll admit. I'm in Boston, you're not. But there are six or seven of you Harvard people involved. Not me, I'm a Naval Academy guy. But Jeff was more than a Navy swabby swinging, swimming in Harvard waters. He was, in some respects, the conscience of that organization. He cherished the very idea of it. He embraced its noble mission to award uh, stipends and scholarships to young women of accomplishment. He had a quasi-religious adherence to its mission and a real commitment to its continued development. He brought the same commitment to his professional work. Corporate strategy and organization, don't worry, we won't be reviewing that. But I would like to mention three things he did professionally that were interesting, relatively unique, and quite demonstrative of what Jeff was. He was attracted to and attracted by a collection of incredibly accomplished individuals, some of whom are here. Uh, Mark Fuller of the Monterey Group, Michael Porter of Harvard Business School, Joe Kennedy of Citizens Energy, who sadly sick in bed and called me this morning. Uh, but Jeff worked with this veritable collection of stars, who guys who challenged all around them, all around them, to do radically different things, and they were all. They had a common trait. They were impossible to work with. <laughs> and there was a certain level of chaos that followed them everywhere. <laughs> and who would want to work with them? Who would want to help them? Jeff, that's who. What did he do? He worked to convert their ideas and their initiatives into practical actions. He interpreted their visions not selfishly, not egotistically. He made them his own. He made them his own to make them more effective. I will stop there, not because there's nothing more to say, because Jeff would want me to get on, would want us all to get on. Go and do something, go get something done. I will stop. But I will remember this solid citizen, this piece of oak, <clears throat> the tempered forge iron that was Jeff, my brother, Kenny's husband, Allison, Katie's father. He was not loud nor overtly bold. His was the essence of quiet leadership. He was, as Douglas MacArthur wrote, the true leader, the one that has the confidence to stand alone, the courage to make decisions, the compassion to listen to and to hear the needs of others. He spoke unwittingly course of Jeff when he added, quote, he does not set out to be a leader, but becomes one 
by the quality of his actions and the integrity of his mind. In the simple words of a colleague, a special guy, a class act, a gentleman, a true gentleman. Fair winds and following seas, Jeff. Thank you. And thank all of you. Sea Fever by Jason Macefield. I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea and sky, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by, and the wheels kick, and the wind song, and the white sails shaking, and a grey mist on the sea's face, and a grey dawn breaking. I must go down to the seas again, for the call of the running tide is a wild call and a clear call that may not be denied. And all I ask is a windy day with the white clouds flying and the flung spray and the blown spume and the seagulls crying. I must go down to the seas again, to the vagrant gypsy life, to the gull's way and the whale's way where the wind's like a wetted knife. And all I ask is a merry yarn from a laughing fellow rover and a quiet sleep and a sweet dream when the long trick's over.
In September of 1973, I arrived at Noblin Greeno School as a brand new 10th grader. As most 10th graders do, I held the seniors in awe, and by October knew all their names. However, none of them knew my name. <laughs> Jeff Grogan was a senior that fall, and I don't think he knew my name, which was the proper order of things. Other than perhaps calling for the ball from me at a soccer practice, I don't recall that Jeff ever spoke to me. Tenth graders do, after all, remember when seniors speak to them. I absolutely, however, could not then have anticipated what a vast role Jeff would someday play in my life, nor had I the slightest inkling of the friendships I would someday have with his marvelous family. Amidst all the scraggly long hair and contrived generational alienation that swirled around the school in those days, Jeff cut quite the distinct figure. He was always better groomed than almost all his classmates. An admittedly low bar, just look at their yearbook. <laughs> Some of them are right over there. Just look at their yearbook. But Jeff nonetheless set a high standard. He was forthright, a true straight shooter, disdaining the more unfortunate social habits of his peers and comporting himself with what can only be called the demeanor of a gentleman. Yet I also recall his rapier wit and ever sparkling eyes, delighting other students and teammates with funny asides and insights, and an occasional very bad pun. In hindsight, it seems obvious that Jeff was destined to attend the Naval Academy from long before he was admitted to the institution. Nor does it seem surprising that Jeff thereafter became an accomplished Naval officer. He was a person of intuitive honor, unimpeachable integrity, unwavering attention to duty, unshakable loyalty, and steady, wise judgment. And he was a sincere patriot, dedicated to upholding the best of this country, even in an era when post-Vietnam angst was so prevalent. I will never forget his appointment to the Naval Academy when it occurred in a nobles morning assembly in the spring of 1974. Other people in this room were there. It was many years before that happened again, and another student followed Jeff to Annapolis in national duty and service. I'll confine my remarks to my direct experience of Jeff, but I feel compelled to note that Jeff had distinguished careers first as a naval officer, as you've heard so eloquently, and then as a business consultant and leader, with exceptional skill and insight regarding the intersection of the public and private sectors. Yet I also know that in the interlude between my connections with Jeff through Nobles, the part of his life of which he was most deeply proud was his family, starting with his courtship and marriage to Kenny, and then welcoming two amazing, brilliant, beautiful daughters, Allie and Katie, into the world, and eventually through to their adulthoods. When I returned to Nobles as head of school nearly a quarter century after having attended as a student, Jeff was already a loyal and ubiquitous volunteer. This started as an active member of the class of 1974 and eventually extended to his involvement in the Graduates Council. I do not remember any discussion about Jeff's nomination to join the Board of Trustees. It was an obvious and valuable choice to bring Jeff, with his wisdom, perspective, professional experience, and love of the school, onto the board. Then, when George Bird stepped down as board chair in 2007, it was the right time to ask Jeff to assume that often thankless mantle as well. He served as board chair from 2007 to 2013, and in that, in that period, I sometimes spoke with Jeff daily, and often weekly. We developed a close relationship out of a combination of necessity and deep mutual respect. When Jeff was named the 2014 Distinguished Graduate from Nobles, I wrote some things for the citation for that award, that I continue to believe deeply to this day. With some editing for this occasion, here's what I said then. It is important to remember that board president is a volunteer position. Jeff spent so much time at Noble simply because he loved the school, and he thoroughly enjoyed his role leading the board. And what a remarkable tenure Jeff had, helming governance through an incredibly productive and dynamic period. He oversaw the creation and articulation of a long-range plan completed before the financial crisis of 2008 that foresaw the need for the school to place a priority on endowment to ensure future excellence. He was instrumental in the design and execution of six board retreats, 
and six years of board focus that decisively advanced the institution and sustained a tradition of excellence in governance. He ensured that the Castle Project stayed on course, insisting on wise measures of finance, implementation of appropriate development work, maintenance of appropriate scope and scale, and establishment of the proper place of the rejuvenated castle and the function and future of the school. Always, Jeff held and sustained the welfare of students and faculty as his highest concern and focus, both in the present and in the context of the far future, long after his involvement would be over. Jeff invariably brought to all these undertakings in his tenure a pragmatic and careful touch, often grabbing the ankles of the dreaming head of school and pulling him down to earth, always in a manner that sustained momentum while advancing the mission of the school. Jeff brought his skill and dedication to every organization with which he was involved, including most notably to Ten Acre Country Day School, where he served on the board for decades and was recently serving as president of the corporation. Jeff felt a profound love and lifelong bond of duty to serve Ten Acre because the school raised him in his childhood, shepherding and supporting him through the death of his own father at a very young age. And then, true to the school mission, nurturing and challenging his own daughters there with such care skill and love. Jeff would be torn between pride and embarrassed humility to hear everyone saying all these wonderful things about it. Indeed, I'm sure he's looking down on us today with his bemused grin, thinking that we should also mention that he was a relentless prankster. We've heard this from others. Recently, Kenny, Allie, Kelly, Kenny, Allie, and Katie regaled me with stories of some of the tricks he played for a laugh. My favorite was greeting boyfriends of the girls, especially Allie's, at the door when they arrived, with a rake and silently pointing to the yard. <laughs> or filling the sneakers of another unfortunate with a layer of breakfast cereal just to test the reaction. This is the best part. There was none. Apparently the young man just put his shoes on and walked away crunching. <laughs> The naval officer and Jeff could have that effect on people. It will not surprise anyone here that Jeff kept files for absolutely everything. Paper files, impeccably ordered, precisely labeled, with an old-fashioned label maker. Kenny, Alley, and Katie showed me one of their favorites. It contained all the things that Jeff thought should be read and shared, if indeed we were ever gathered like this about him after his final demise. The title of the file was Classic Jeff Grogan. It said simply, uh-oh. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous? It may, however, surprise many people here quite a bit that Jeff was a cancer survivor. You've heard mention of that. He had just experienced a fully clear cancer scan shortly before passing away, a cruel irony after a three-year battle with melanoma that he was winning. He told very few people about this. I only learned of it from Kenny after his passing. In this struggle, we can see Jeff's courage and fortitude, his deep unwillingness to burden others with any of his troubles, and his magnificent will and spirit. We will, however, remember Jeff most for his impish smile, his hearty laugh, his marvelous sense of humor, and the ever-present twinkle in his eye. We feel his absence in our hearts so deeply because we know we have lost a father husband, friend, brother, uncle, mentor, leader, and volunteer who exemplified compassion, engaged listening, and empathy while always striving to do and stand for the good, the decent, and the righteous. He was also a pragmatist, focused on getting things done, planning, outlining, organizing, and advancing each cause and project to full fruition. Yet his practicality and his quest for order were fundamentally guided by a profound code of ethics, desire to make everyone with whom he interacted feel included and valued, and a dedication to making the world a better place in a manner that simply defined the essence of his humanity. I owe Jeff a personal debt, debt for his support that I can never fully repay. That debt is grounded entirely in Jeff's virtues, in his loyalty, patience, duty, honor, intelligence, dedication to friends and institutions, and balanced, superb judgment. In that sense, for me, and I'm sure for all of us, he is not entirely gone. 
because he left us with so many gifts that we will carry forward in the world. Jeff is a part of us forever. And that is certainly true for his beloved Kenny, as well as for Allie and Katie, who miss him painfully, but who need to know that he is with them, part of them, loving them, always. While the selection of this song may have surprised some uh, at first blush, it did make the uh-oh folder. <laughs> and it makes a great deal of sense that uh, someone who was as true to every institution he served uh, would make this request. When some loud bragger tries to put me down, and says his school is great. I tell him right away, now what's the matter, buddy? Ain't you heard of my school? It's number one in the state. My name is Greg Petersmeyer. Jeff and I met when he was 14. I was in college, a year ahead of his sister Fitzy, whom I was crazy about. Jeff was essentially a brother to me for 50 years. At 14, Jeff was a rascal, and at the time would have won any movie casting call for a young Irish boy filled with mischief. 
At 14, when you looked into that face and the light in those eyes and that smile, everyone simply knew mischief was at hand. That Jeff knew where to create it, how to find it, and how to be in the middle of it. And in those days, he was also operating with free range, well under his mother's radar systems, which were fully occupied trying to keep track of Rick. <laughs> These last few days for me had been rich in emotion and meaning. Thinking about Jeff and thinking about him with a few of those who are here today and who back then knew Jeff best and loved him most, like the Grogan's, excuse me, like the Gowdies and Paul George. And of course, I've been spending time with Kenny, Allie, and Katie, who know him best and love him most now. They and others have all contributed to what I want to share. The United States Navy has received a lot of attention today. So I want to start with a word about Jeff and the Navy. It's certainly the case that when Kenny and Jeff met, Kenny immediately became Jeff's world, and Jeff became Kenny's world. That's the way it stayed. But at the time, there was also the Navy in Jeff's life. When Jeff was accepted into the United States Naval Academy, he stepped out of one world and into a different one, one utterly unfamiliar to his friends, his family, and to Jeff. Anything resembling his life in Wellesley was unceremoniously stripped away the instant he reported for his plea summer. No more sidling up to the club snack bar like he was the club mayor, or simply deciding what neighborhood pool he and Trevor Gowdy would grace that night with their pool hopping presence. <laughs> Jeff became a number, and just a number, who now was up against the best other numbers from all over the nation. It was a brave decision by Jeff to attend Annapolis, to take an unfamiliar path and one that would test him every day. In early February of his plea year, Fitzy called me to ask if I might drive out to Annapolis to check on him. I was working in Washington at the time. She had talked to him on the phone, and she was worried by the discouragement in his voice. So the next night, I drove to Annapolis and arrived at Bancroft Hall at about 9.30 to see if I could see Jeff. I was told he wasn't in his room and was probably in the library, but would need to be back in his room by 10 o'clock. A midshipman pointed me in the direction of the library and I headed off across the cold, dark, and seemingly deserted campus toward the library. In a bit, in the distance, coming toward me, first, as just a speck, was a solitary figure walking slowly with his head down and his coat collar pulled up. He was the only person in sight, and as our paths approached, while I couldn't see most of his face because of the visor of his navy hat, when we were upon one another, it was Jeff. He was surprised to see me. We embraced in the frigid path and went back to Bancroft Hall to talk for a few minutes. He seemed flat, tired, and alone. He said that the schedule was regimented and murderous, and there were heavy engineering classes, and the physical demands were steep. He wasn't sure he was going to make it. We talked until he had to head to his room. I told him we were all proud of him, and he said he appreciated the visit. Well, to put it mildly, Jeff did make it. He had a real sense of honor that began for him earlier than the Naval Academy. His father and mother had exceptionally high standards and values across the board, and expected people to live up to them. But as Paul George put it, 
There's something about four years of living and breathing, honor and service and reliability that is unmatched. Then there was the actual crucible of leadership for a young naval officer, only in his early 20s, standing on the bridge, giving the orders to the helmsman driving a massive steel ship, a football field and a half in length, with 350 sailors on board and 30 guided missiles. When there's an aircraft carrier and other destroyers moving with you in the convoy in the night sea, there's a lot that can go wrong. The Navy tested Jeff. It helped him to develop into a superb leader, and it made him even prouder to be an American. For these and many other reasons, the United States Navy created an almost mystical tug on Jeff Grogan that began at Annapolis and remained with him for the rest of his life. This is a bit of a relay here, so bear with us. This, all, this was all planned. Um, today there have been wonderful reflections on Jeff's sense of humor. It's a very interesting topic to me, Jeff's humor. Looking back now, what interests me the most about it relates to the notion that a good joke or humor can help clarify and express complex feelings. I think feelings were at the heart of Jeff's use of humor. For Jeff, humor was always about connecting with, other, with the other person. At times, it had a very serious purpose, where Jeff wrapped his humor around his deep concern and love here are two examples. In the summer of 1984, his sister was at Mass General waiting for a liver transplant, which was the most aggressive surgery imaginable at the time. Jeff was desperately worried that while she waited for a donor, she would not be able to keep her strength up for the fight ahead and to survive the operation. So he brought his boxing gloves to the hospital and he tied them to the bed. Or just a couple of years ago, when Julie was fighting her own health battle, she opened a package from Jeff. It was a baseball cap with the words emblazoned across the brim, don't give up the ship. For Jeff, he always wanted to connect most to those he loved, to be with them, to enjoy them, to make time count, to make time stop. He was a master of that kind of humor, and it was almost always little things. For example, when Jeff was a teenager and beyond, every time he and Fitzy saw each other, if they even had just been away for a week or so, one or the other of them would insist that they immediately stand back to back to see who was now taller, <laughs> in a ritual that went on for several years. It only stopped when it was clear to both of them that Jeff had finally passed Fitzy. But even for a while after that, Jeff insisted on continuing periodic measurements. <laughs> In recent years, more than anything, his sense of humor was his way of loving Allie and Katie, playing with them, laughing with them, and simply being as much in their lives as possible, even if that meant obnoxious humor. On the Central Park Pond in New York, there are remote control sailboats. Simple navigational etiquette means leaving space between your boat and another person's boat, not to turn your boat into a bumper car. <laughs> but that is exactly what Jeff would do, crash into other boats of random strangers simply to have the fun and get the rise of embarrassment out of alley. <laughs> And of course, the girls' boyfriends, as we've learned, were a special subject. As you've heard, raking leaves before entering the house was required the first time a boy came over, and Cheerios and the shoes followed. This last summer, Jeff tried to take the boys out on a shark tagging excursion. He just liked the idea of those two boys being so close to the edge of a boat and to sharks at the same time. <laughs> So again, while Jeff's humor was all about loving those girls, it was also a way of honoring and embracing anybody who cared about Katie and Allie. A few weeks ago, at the Washington National Cathedral, the funeral service for a more famous vet veteran, General Colin Powell, was held. His son, Michael, shared moving, 
personal reflections about his father. And at the close of his remarks, this is what Michael said. I've heard it asked, are we still making his kind? I believe the answer to that question is up to us. To honor his legacy, I hope we do more than consign him to the history books. I hope we recommit ourselves to being a nation where we are still making his kind. Jeff's death has caused me to think about Michael Powell's question. Because Jeff Grogan, like Colin Powell, was a great human being because he was so good. So here we are now without Jeff, but we're still here as makers of ourselves and at least, if not makers, at least contributors to who our family members and friends themselves are and who the people are around us in the schools, enterprises, and communities that Jeff loved. So let me say a few words about what I believe made Jeff so good. And that is worth, and, and that is worth living on in greater measure with our help. Jeff believed in taking responsibility, which meant being prepared, doing the work. He took responsibility for people and organizations his entire life. Responsibility for his mother, for his shipmates, for every business enterprise, committee, initiative, or assignment he was part of, for Nobles and for Ten Acre, and most of all, for Kenny, Allie, and Katie. Jeff had extremely high standards, which he learned initially from his father and mother. He believed there was a right way and a wrong way to do everything. The high standards he set for others, he always would first meet himself. This started early. The Grogan children were known for many things, but one of those things was working harder and giving their absolute best to whatever they did, whether in school, work, or in sports. Jeff believed in institutions and in their capacity for self-renewal. If their mission was valuable enough and good people cared enough, to invest in the institution's success. And he believed in young people. He loved helping them learn and grow, Allie and Katie most of all. He loved to teach, coach, and mentor, which was one of the reasons he got the highest scores in the Navy from students in his courses. And of course, it was part of what he loved about being around Nobles and Ten Acre. Jeff took the measure of a person for the right reasons. He didn't think he was better than anyone else, nor that anyone was better than him. I think he picked that up, some of that attitude from his father, Dr. Grogan, a brilliant physician who broke a barrier being appointed the first Harvard Medical School professor as an Irish Catholic. Jeff always tried to treat people fairly, and he was the furthest thing from a snob. The only kind of person Jeff couldn't stand was a fraud. But most importantly, Jeff simply cared about people and treated people well. That was because at his core, Jeff respected the inherent dignity of the individual human being. I really believe that this core belief in human dignity of every individual was a big part of what for Jeff justified the very notions of integrity, honor, duty, sacrifice, and service. It's part of why he was patriotic and revered America's willingness to fight tyranny and to defend human freedom to the death. It was central to his empathy and why he was such an intent and effective listener to a friend or a stranger. And it was why he was always willing to help. It occurred to me that, in fact, we can pass on a lot about Jeff and how he cared for people by thinking about this scene that Ali shared with me. It not only speaks about Jeff's care for his daughters, but it tells, but I tell it here because it rings so true about how Jeff cared for everyone. 
When he would drop me off at the train to head back to New York, Allie said, he always insisted to not only walk into the station, but up onto the platform. And then when the train came and I went inside, he would walk along the outside of the car until I found my seat. And then when the train began moving, he would walk with the train until it was getting ahead of him, at which point he would stop and salute. Jeff was a warm and happy fellow, brave and accomplished, kind and true. But the one thing I will always remember was his light. It was the light in his eyes, the light in his smile, the light in his face. You didn't have to say anything, but you knew he understood you and cared about you. The fact is, Jeff Brogan's true heart never failed. Finally, let me close by honoring Jeff in this way. As we all are aware, Jeff and Rick experienced losses. Jeff was 10 when he lost his father, and before he was 30, he had lost his mother and his sister. Much of today's meaning is the love that Jeff received from family members, friends, schools, and other institutions that stepped into his life to embrace him in those times and after those moments of tremendous loss. I'm certain part of why Jeff gave back mightily to Ten Acre and Nobles. It was in gratitude. But even more for me, today is about the transcendent relay race of Jeff's life, and of Rick's too. Those first Grogan's, that immediate family, that Jeff was born into. They had the greatest possible love, devotion, fun, service, energy, and life for one another imaginable. That was to be the baton. It was those values and devotions, those ways of embracing people and life that was at the heart of what Jeff was determined to get busy building on his own, in his own immediate family. But it was those values and devotions that were his baton in his own grand relay race. That is the baton that carried Jeff forward. That is the baton that with grace, care, and happiness and love carried Jeff all the way home. We will miss him very much. I'm Julie Petersmeyer, and I am going to share with you a reading 
that was meaningful to Jeff. From the Holy Gospel of Jesus Christ, according to John. Let your hearts not be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also, and you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. Amen. Thomas asks Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus replied, I am the way. Did you know that the first followers of Jesus simply referred to themselves as the way? It must have made perfect sense to them given that they were following Jesus' way of love and compassion, justice, and kindness. It is a way that brought them close to their own heart, to each other, and to God. This was Jeff's way. He knew a powerful and loving God, and his life was guided by the light of such love. You all here have witnessed this great love in Jeff. And the people said, Amen. Amen. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Look around. Jeff had a broad love that he brought to each of you and to everything he did. He shared his holy and playful love in abundance with Kenny his life partner and soulmate, and his with, with his beloved daughters, Allie and Katie. Always the jokester, they laughed with Jeff throughout their lives. Jeff's faith in God nurtured in him a sense of honor, service, loyalty, and above all, an unwavering integrity to be true to the high standards of hard work on behalf of others and always infused with deep joy and a playful spirit. Jeff loved the Catholic Church where he grew up. He loved this church, and he loved the beautiful Naval Academy Chapel. When he was in that chapel, he felt like he was home, a spiritual home where he was with God. Jeff knew when he died, he would be united with his parents and his sister. He believed in the everlasting arms of God. Here, we believe in that too. Our God does not forsake us. Our God is present with us in life and in death. These are the promises of a gracious God we know in Jesus Christ. Our hearts break that Jeff's bright light no longer shines in the way that we have known in our days, but surely the angels are dancing and laughing more. And now we all can do what Jeff did. 
and search our own hearts and souls for the light of God to heal and guide us into a new day. Our God invites us in. May it be so. Amen. And now let us pray. O God, our strength and our redeemer, giver of life and conqueror of death, we praise you with humble hearts. With faith in your great mercy and wisdom, we entrust Jeff to your eternal care. We praise you for your steadfast love for him all the days of his earthly life. We thank you for all that he was to those who loved him. His love and care for his family and his community. We thank you for his faithfulness to the Church of Jesus Christ. And we are grateful that for Jeff, all sickness and sorrow are ended and death itself has passed. He has entered the home where all your people gather in peace. We pray that you would keep us in communion with your faithful people in every time and place that at last we may rejoice together in that heavenly family where Jesus Christ reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever. God, our creator, you only are immortal, the maker of all. We are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth we shall return. This you ordained when you created us, saying, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even in our sorrow we make our song. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. So into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Jeff. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, and a son of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the company of the saints in the light. Amen. Friends, when he walked on the earth, Jesus taught his disciples to pray these words so that they and we could always have words to reach out to God with the prayers held deepest in our hearts. Will you join me in praying? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now will you rise and join in our closing hymn, Navy Blue and Gold.
I think they heard that all the way <laughs> to the game. <laughs> Dear ones following the service, please join the family at Woodlawn Cemetery for the internment with military honors, followed by a reception at Weston Golf Club. In the meantime, please remain in your pew while the postlude is going, and at the time of the postlude, the beginning of the postlude, all the pallbearers come forward and will bring the casket out, and the family will follow. Receive this final blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace. Go in peace. You may be seated. <clears throat>